This next video is going to focus on chemical control of microbial growth. And so, you know, antimicrobial chemicals do come in all forms, solids, liquids, and gases. Um, but the ones we're going to talk about um, come in liquid form. And, and those are ones that people tend to use most often. And so we can divide these into different categories based on their solvents and most commonly used um, are aqueous solutions, which has water as the solvent, and tinctures, which have um, an alcohol as a solvent. So what do we need in a um, germicide, a chemical agent, uh, that's going to make it effective? So we need it to act quickly, even in low concentrations. Okay, uh, because most of them are need to be um, need to use water or alcohol as a solvent. So therefore, the agents themselves must be soluble in water or alcohol for a, a, the long term. Also, we prefer to have these chemical agents be broad spectrum in terms of their microbial action, which means they're going to target a lot of different microbes, right? It would not be really effective to need to spray Lysol to kill bacteria, but I'm gonna need bleach to kill this other type of bacteria, and I'm gonna need this other agent to kill fungus, right? You'd be cleaning all day long because you'd have to use 20 different chemical agents if they were narrow spectrum. So by using a broad spectrum germicide, then you're killing a nice wide um, range of organisms. We also would prefer for these chemical agents to be able to penetrate through inanimate surfaces, right? Sustain this cumulative persistent uh, action. And we want them to not become inactivated by organic matter. Right, because again, especially in healthcare settings, you're going to be dealing with things like vomit or um, stool, other types of organic matter that um, is going to be mixed in with your um, cleaning surface, um, or at least on top of the cleaning surface. And so you want to make sure that these chemical agents are still going to be able to work in the presence of organic matter. You don't want them to be corrosive or staining. You don't want them to damage the person that is using the agent or damage the surface that the agent is being applied to. Of course, they need to have sanitizing and deodorizing properties. They need to actually be doing their job and not smell too horrible, right? Because things that have too strong of an odor or even a dangerous odor um, would be really um, problematic especially in a healthcare setting. And we need these agents to be affordable and readily available. It's not very helpful if the agent you need costs $5,000, but you can only get it in Budapest, right? Um, so we like to use things that are easy to access and affordable. So what are going to affect the microbial um, activity or micro, sorry, microbicidal activity of chemicals. And really, these are things we talked about before, things that affect, um, you know, death rates and things like that. So the nature of the organism that's being treated, because as we know, some organisms are more difficult to kill than others. The nature of the material being treated. Are you trying to treat a more porous surface or a more solid surface, right? That might need to be considered. The degree of contamination. Again, do we have a big spill um, or do we have, you know, just a potentially dirty surface because people have been touching the countertops or, you know, setting their used utensils down on top? So how contaminated is the surface? The time of exposure. Okay, do we need to leave this antibacterial agent on there for an hour for it to be effective or can we spray and wipe immediately? And then the strength and chemical action of the germicide. Because again, if it's a very weak diluted concentration, you're probably going to need a longer exposure time. But if it's a strong, more potent concentration, you won't need to leave it on uh, for quite as long. So we're only going to talk about a few chemical agents, uh, one being alcohols. And so when trying to control microbial growth, either, either ethanol, which is ethyl alcohol, 
or isopropyl alcohol, which is what we normally call rubbing alcohol, are most appropriate, but there's greater if, um, efficacy at 70%, which means you dilute the pure alcohol with water, because again, water helps um, denature proteins and things like that. So having water mixed in with the alcohol makes it more effective. So these are disinfectants. Okay, notice they do not kill endospores, but they are most effective against um, non, I'm sorry, against enveloped viruses compared to non-enveloped viruses because they can degrade that viral envelope. So you'll notice I, I kind of compared and contrasted ethanol to rubbing alcohol, but um, they both have more of a, a de-germing or disinfection um, need, right? So skin de-germing, if you're putting it on your hands, um, disinfectant is if you're using it on an inanimate object, so like medical equipment. And the big um kind of downfall of the alcohols is that they evaporate very very quickly so there's a very low um, exposure time with rubbing alcohol it has a more microbicidal effect and it's actually a little bit cheaper than ethanol but it also evaporates very quickly and the vapors can be bad for the nervous system okay so now if you're applying rubbing alcohol to your skin real quick. Those vapors aren't going to be that problematic, but it's prolonged exposure to vapors um, that can negatively affect the nervous system. So alcohols are actually what you really should go to if you have a flesh wound, especially if it's a deep cut, you're going to want to go with alcohol more than hydrogen peroxide, and we'll talk about why right now. So hydrogen peroxide does have a germicidal effect. Um, due to toxic reactive oxygen that's associated with it. So notice that at high concentrations, um, hydrogen peroxide can kill bacteria, viruses, fungus, and even endospores, okay? And it can be used on the skin as an antiseptic, or it can be used on inanimate surfaces um, and objects as a disinfectant. Okay, so, but I want to kind of caution you about using hydrogen peroxide as an antiseptic, especially if it's on like a minor cut, like if you um, like get a paper cut, or maybe like you're outside dealing with like, I don't know, you get scraped by a tree branch or something like that, or just kind of scrape your skin. Um, hydrogen peroxide isn't the, the best option as an antiseptic in those cases, because if you look at the reaction above those pictures, a lot of bacteria that are on the surface of the skin or right underneath the surface of the skin, they naturally have the enzyme catalase. And catalase, its sole purpose is to break down hydrogen peroxide into water and gaseous oxygen, hence the bubbles. And so a lot of people like me, before I learned about this, I went to hydrogen peroxide because it doesn't sting and those bubbles give you this like sense of security like yes it's working it's killing things that's not actually what's happening the bubbles mean that the bacteria has broken down the peroxide okay so those bubbles can still have like a washing effect right so again if it's not a very deep wound if any dirt got in there those bubbles could bring that dirt and debris to the surface um, but it's not necessarily killing those organisms because they have that enzyme meant to break it down. Okay, so those bubbles can actually be kind of a false sense of security. Um, now, if you have a deeper wound where it's kind of more of an anaerobic environment, then that peroxide can be effective there. But it's just a safe bet if you have a flesh wound, alcohol is the better, safer, more effective bet. Okay? But you do find peroxide um, in things like mouthwashes, like in your mouth, you're going to swish around for a while um, because those don't always have the catalase. And so they're more effective at um, kind of help cleaning out your mouth and giving you better breath and things. But peroxide is great, super great on uh, as a disinfectant. So they're used in like um, 
cleaning solutions for contacts and all sorts of different types of equipments and utensils and things like that. So peroxide is much more effective as a disinfectant than an antiseptic for minor flesh wounds. All right, last but not least, surfactants. So these are gonna be things like soaps and detergents, um, and they do have limited microbicidal power, um, but why these are able to work is because of their amphipathic nature. So remember, we talked about amphipathic back in unit one when we talked about uh, properties of phospholipids. So amphipathic molecules are both hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So if you look at the little blue molecules in this picture, they look very similar to the, the beige-ish, yellowish phospholipids that make up the plasma membrane. You'll notice the little blue, the surfactant, um, has only one little tail as opposed to two, like the phospholipids, but they behave enough like a phospholipid that they're able to squeeze their way in between the phospholipids right, and alter the permeability of the membrane, okay? And so um, it's gonna cause them to be leaky and um, kill some of the bacteria. But also when you're like washing your hands, right, a lot of times we get that oily sebum residue on our hands, and so that's hydrophobic. And so when you put soap on your hands, like if you're in the bathroom, um, the soap, the hydrophobic part of the soap is going to attach to that oily, dirty residue. But when you stick your hands then under the water, the hydrophilic region of the soap is going to be attracted to the water that's running off your hands. And so the hydrophilic portion of the soap molecule will, will go to the water, which will then drag it off your hand and down the drain. Okay, so that's another neat way that soaps work. Part of the soap originally binds to the, the oils and dirts on your hand, and then the hydrophilic part is then going to go with the water once you rinse your hands off, taking the dirt and oil with it. Now, surfactants are, uh, their activity is reduced by the presence of organic matter. So a lot of times they're mainly used for mechanical removal of microbes. That's like rubbing your hand um, and then sticking it under the water where the water is going to rinse off. Um, the surfactant. All right, y'all, that is the end of our discussion on uh, chemical methods of control, and it wraps up this entire uh, portion of the class. Let me know if you have any questions.